In October 1666, news arrived in Florence of an extraordinarily large white shark caught in Livorno, the port city of Tuscany. Having heard this, Grand Duke Ferdinand II de' Medici, the last patron of Galileo Galilei, asked for the shark's head to be shipped up the river Arno to Florence and to have Nicolaus Steno, the new anatomist at court, dissected. Steno had settled in the Florentine court in the summer. Since dissection was something that Steno did regularly, he accepted the invitation. Moreover, why not use the shark to explore those very same questions about anatomy that he was already researching about muscles, glands, and the reproductive organs? The shark's dissection took place around 18 October and became known for igniting Nicolaus Steno's geological research, which made him known today as, quote, the founder of modern geology. In short, so the story goes, Steno realized during the dissection from the sea. This led him to argue that the earth has a history which can be known through a series of rules still taught today as Steno's principles of stratigraphy. In the words of historian of geology Martin Rudwig and many others after him, Steno's examination of these sharks teeth had, quote, a striking catalytic effect in the history of science and the study of fossils. The problem with associating this shark's dissection with Steno's research on fossils, however, is that none of the eyewitnesses to the dissection mentioned the shark's teeth, nor anything related to fossils. One of the eyewitnesses was Lorenzo Magalotti, secretary of the Academia del Cimento, the Florentine Academy of Natural Experiments supported by the Medici family. About a week after the dissection took place, Magalotti wrote to the intellectually curious Archbishop, Archbishop of Siena that the shark was examined by, quote, the finest knife of Mr. Nicolaus Steno. He also highlighted three different aspects of Steno's anatomical dissection, none of which was related to shark teeth. Carlo Dati, another intellectual at the Medici courts, also mentioned to a friend that the shark was explicitly brought to Florence for Steno to make anatomical observations. Finally, five weeks later, in a recently discovered letter, Prince Leopoldo de' Medici, the main sponsor of the Academia del Cimento, wrote various praises of Steno, but without ever mentioning fossils or the earth. Therefore, at least in the five weeks after this dissection took place, it seems that no one associated the dissection of this shark with fossils. More importantly, in the months that followed, there is no reference at all to fossils in Steno's writings. How then did Steno go from performing an anatomical dissection to making claims about rocks? Two recent attempts to answer this question show how difficult but important it is to contextualize Steno's shift from anatomy to earth history. One attempt is the explanation of continuity. This explanation argues that Steno was already working on fossils long before making this dissection. The problem with this explanation is that no primary sources show that Steno had a research interest on fossils before publishing on the topic for the first time, six months after the dissection of the shark took place. Steno was certainly familiar with the debate on fossils, but familiarity does not translate to expertise. The other attempt to, to explain Steno's turn to fossils is the theory of discontinuity. It argues that Steno completely shifted his work from the body to the earth because of the needs of the Medici court. It claims that Steno adopted a method based on observations that was written of philosophical interpretations in order to make his research more similar to works sponsored by the Medici court. But whereas Steno's new social context in Florence did foster his research interests, its effect was not as dramatic as it may seem. In this talk, I challenge both theories of continuity and discontinuity to argue that the answer lies somewhere in the middle. I claim that the trigger that turned Steno's attention to the earth rather than dissecting a shark 
was reading a manuscript that challenged his research methods. But this trigger, I argue, was intrinsically associated with his research on the body. This question of how Steno shifted from anatomy to earth history is significant because it allows me to address broader themes in the history of science. How and why did different areas of knowledge intersect and relate to each other in the early modern period? What shared assumptions existed, if any, underneath the various interests of early modern polymaths? And perhaps more importantly, how well do our modern views of polymathy and disciplinary boundaries apply to the early modern period? Although historians have called the 17th century a golden age of polymaths, the historical analysis of how disciplines intersected is still an open field. Nicolaus Steno's career is an example of this historiographic phenomenon. Raised in Copenhagen, Steno became a successful anatomist while traveling through the Netherlands, France, and Italy in the third quarter of the 17th century, the generation after Galileo. In these places, he rapidly entered the circles of the first scientific academies of Europe, such as the Académie de Sciences in Paris and the Académie del Cimento in Florence. But due to his subsequent work in geology and his religious conversion in Florence, his life is usually told in fragmented parts. Today, Steno is known either as the founder of modern geology or as a science and religion hero. My goal is to avoid not only these present descriptions, but also the more tempting category of polymath. Instead, I read Steno on his own terms and argue that he was an anatomist at his core, but one who became increasingly interested in chemistry, mathematics, geology, and theology. In this talk, I want to jump directly to Steno's first year in Florence. This is the year in which Steno shifted his research from the body to fossils. I show that taking Steno's anatomy seriously leads to a more sophisticated understanding of his geology, as well as his integration into the Medici courts. At the same time, I also situate Steno's work in the broader history of how scholars started to study nature under same principles and laws. Just like Rene Descartes and Isaac Newton used the motion of earthly projectiles to understand the motion of things in the heavens, Nicolaus Steno applied his understanding of the body to the earth. In the rest of this talk, I will follow Steno's steps from his dissection of the, star of the shark in Florence to the publication of the book De Solido, that is considered his masterpiece in geology, three years later. Throughout this story, I will add flashbacks to his early anatomical career, which, as I will show, are key to grasp his shift from the body to the earth. When Steno dissected the famous shark in October, he had just completed a manuscript on a new mathematical model of muscle contraction. This is known because the book's first imprimatur, the typical ecclesiastical approval of a book, dates from 27 October 1666. However, in light of, the, of his dissection of the shark, Steno decided to place the printing on hold so that he could add his anatomical remarks on the shark to the book. And this is exactly what happened. The book was published in April, 1667, under the title, A Sample of the Elements of Myology, myology being the study of muscles, with an additional description of the shark's head. It was in this description that Steno included his first treatise on fossils. Historians have assumed that the text on fossils was complete by the end of 1666, two months after the dissection took place. This is because a second and final imprimatur dated from December 1666 is preceded by a censor's report mentioning the shark's head. If it is true that the text on fossils was complete by the end of 66, then Steno would have written his first treatise on fossils in the month and a half that followed his dissection. This would indicate either that Steno was a genius who wrote a major treatise on fossils in only a few weeks, or that he had already written it before the shark's dissection. My research has uncovered new materials that indicate that this imprimatur is misleading and that the time between the approval of the book 
and its publication is longer than was previously thought. The book's manuscript still preserved at the Royal Library of Copenhagen and yet rarely used by historians shows that the original December approval refers only to quote, a work on the elements of myology. Indeed, the censors only reviewed the text on the shark's head at the end of February, 1667, two months later. Strikingly, Steno's new ideas on fossils were not included in the original manuscript reviewed by the censors in February. This can be known because the February approval appears in a page before the folios on fossils begin. More importantly, the original manuscript that was reviewed by the censors mentions only one copper plate, namely the copper plate of the shark's head. You can see the singular am being used here and the identification of the copper plate as being of the shark's head and teeth, lamie caput et dentes. The final printed version, on the other hand, refers to two copper plates in total. A second plate on fossils that looked like shark's teeth, known as tungstones or glossopetre, was added later. In short, this long process of the manuscript submission and reviews shows that Steno's treatise on fossils was not yet ready four months after he dissected the shark. That is, Steno probably started writing on fossils after he dissected the shark, but he had a longer period to develop his ideas than historians have assumed until now. Why then did Steno decide to write on fossils? To answer this question, it is useful to take a step back and to look at Steno's early formation and research in anatomy. Unlike other areas of knowledge, anatomy in the 17th century was deeply Aristotelian because it relied on the comparative method of Aristotle's works on animals. This method, known as Historia Anatomica, consisted in searching for similarities between the same bodily parts in as many animals as possible. This is exactly what William Harvey did when studying the circulation of the blood, as well as Thomas Bartholin, Steno's professor at the University of Copenhagen and editor of the most important textbook of anatomy in the 17th century one plate of which I am showing here. Steno was not an exception to this trend. He applied this comparative method in his very first anatomical publication, where he announced the discovery of a new salivary duct that modern anatomy textbooks still call Steno's duct. For this work alone, Steno dissected and compared glands in a lamb, a cow, a sheep, many dogs and rabbits and human cadavers. But what happens when two supposedly different organs shared too many similarities? To answer this question, Steno took anatomy's comparative method a step further, the step that would also lead him to start writing on fossils. When dissecting muscles for the first time, Steno noticed a great similarity between the tissues of the heart and muscle fibers. In his second book, published two years after the shark's or before the shark's dissection, Steno wrote that, quote, in muscles, like in all the substance of the heart, nothing else occurs other than arteries, veins, nerves, fibers, membranes. Therefore, he wrote, quote, if it is certain that the heart and muscle are made of the same substance, then truly the heart must be greeted with the name of muscle. This claim, which was also made by a few others at the time, challenged the traditional understanding of the heart, also shared by William Harvey, that the heart was a unique source of energy for the entire body. But for Steno, equivalence of substance was enough to convince him that the heart was just a muscle. In Florence, in the months after dissecting the shark, when he was already writing on fossils, Steno used again similarities between different organs to demonstrate something new about the female reproductive system. When dissecting the bodies of various mammalians, including human females, Steno observed that what until then had been called female testicles contained inside eggs. Until then, many anatomists still thought that female ovaries, then called female testicles, contributed little to animal reproduction. They existed only as mere vestiges in women 
just like nipples in men. Instead, Steno concluded that, quote, the testicles of females are analogous to an ovary, like in fishes and other animals. Steno published this observation as a side comment to a larger description of another shark that he dissected. Yet, for Steno, this small note and its accompanying illustration, the historia of the ovaries, were enough, quote, to show the, gen the, the analogy of the genital parts and to remove this error by which it is believed that the genitals of women are analogous to the genitals of men. Steno promised to work further on this topic, but his emerging interest on fossils led him away from it. In the end, Steno's Dutch friends, Renier de Graaf, who described the development of ovarian or graphene follicles, and the famous microscopist Jan Swammerdam took the lead in exploring these matters first, further. But one thing is true, Steno's firm commitment to comparative anatomy opened the door for a new understanding of female ovaries and, as I will now show, to a new history of the Earth. Soon after the shark's dissection took place in October, the literary scholar Carlo Dati, one of the eyewitnesses to the shark's dissection, had an idea. He had recently acquired the almost 100 years old manuscript of the Metalloteca Vaticana, an extensive description of the Vatican's mineral collection. The text had been written by the collection's curator in the 16th century, the papal physician Michele Mercati. Dati wanted to publish the book in Florence and dedicate it to the Pope, but he never managed to, to do it. For this reason, he saw Steno's new work on the shark as an opportunity to display one of the beautiful images from the manuscript, namely the head of the great white shark. Dati lent the manuscript to Steno and suggested that he use the plate in his publication, which Steno agreed to. Now, if you think that this image looks more like a monster than a shark, that's okay. There are good reasons to think that. But what matters is that Steno also focused on the text itself, the manuscript, that is on what Mercati had to say on shark's teeth. What he read dramatically changed his research career. In his manuscript, Mercati claimed that because of their similarity, fossils and the teeth of sharks, quote, are confused even by the learned and that it was an error to say that they were the same. That is for Mercati, despite their great resemblance, fossils and shark's teeth were not the same thing. Mercati was not the only one with this opinion in the early modern period. But for now, notice that this claim directly contradicted Steno's radical exploration of analogies of equivalence in anatomy. Whereas Steno claimed that two distinct but similar organs were of the same substance, like muscles and heart, Mercati claimed the exact opposite in a different field. By this time, as we just saw, Steno was fully engaged in using comparative methods in anatomy. In addition, he often associated this method with an intense desire to fight uncertainty in anatomy. Yet, adding fuel to the fire, Mercati also claimed to fight uncertainty in natural history. He wrote that he wanted, quote, to be as clear as possible, and not only to teach, but also to remove false and supposed things. How could Mercati aim for the same scientific rigor as Steno, and yet conclude that sharks' teeth and fossils were different despite their obvious similarities? Faced with this stark methodological difference, Steno had to respond. Therefore, he added to his account of the shark's head what he called a digression on the origin of fossils and on the soils themselves where these, soil, where these fossils are found. In this digression, Steno scrupulously applied the methods he had developed as an anatomist to study fossils. He described the various fossils, the various soils where fossils resembling parts of sea animals are found. And as a good anatomist, he entitled this observational description a historian. It was in this Historia description that Steno first wrote that these soils are, quote, composed of layers imposed on each other and inclined to the horizon. Ideas that resemble the modern principles of superposition of strata and of original horizontality, for which Steno would become very renowned. In the end, this Historia of soils 
allowed Steno to apply his comparative method to fossils. He argued that fossils, quote, are teeth of the great white shark because of their great similarity, since planes are most similar to planes, sides to sides, and base to base. Ironically, he relied on Mercati's copper plates to support his point visually. But if fossils were really teeth of sharks, how did they end up on mountaintops? To answer this, Steno channeled his anxiety for certainty to explain the formation of soils and of fossilization. That is, he wrote the history of the earth with the same methods that he used in his Historia of the Body. Since his early days studying the body, Nicolaus Steno manifested a deep interest in finding certain or reliable knowledge about nature. This interest was a response to the crisis of certainty of his time. Steno was well aware that new systems that explain natural phenomena in a sound way often differ to their core. Just think of Gassendi's belief in the existence of the vacuum and Descartes' rejection of it, or the Jesuits' adoption of a geoheliocentric astronomy versus Galileo's heliocentrism. That is, there were theories that could explain all the available observations, but these theories were often diametrically opposite to one another. In anatomy, Steno also faced this problem and became obsessed with solving it. For him, certainty did not necessarily mean finding the absolute certitude of geometry. Rather, it meant finding knowledge that was reliable and that described natural phenomena in compelling and accurate ways. He did that by combining intellectual reasoning with as many observations as possible. This reliance on observations, typical of early modern anatomy, was understood by Steno and his peers to be in contrast with Cartesian medicine, which they criticized for not relying enough on observations. For this reason, Steno also thought that good research should rule out that which is not certain. And Steno had some strong words about this, saying that not distinguishing certain from uncertain knowledge in anatomy could lead to fatal errors in medicine. His dissection of the brain in Paris one year before the shark's dissection took place was mostly focused in showing that, quote, the substance of the brain is still poorly known. Steno's emphasis on observations was broader than just opening up animals. He also used knowledge and observations from across various disciplines to make his claims about the body more intelligible and reliable. For instance, Steno often drew on examples from mechanics and hydrostatics. He compared glands to sieves of blood that functioned according to the speed of blood flow. He described glandular secretions as lubrication fluids of the body. He compared veins to siphons and muscles to complex pulleys. He also used examples from chemistry, for instance, to argue that blood carries several substances within itself, despite its uniform red color. He spoke of the chemical reaction of two non-red substances that also resulted in a red product. And he mentioned the reaction between butter of antimony and spirit of nitre. These analogies reflected an approach that was especially popular at the University of Leiden, where Steno studied and worked before moving to Florence. But Steno's most sophisticated analogy appeared in Florence. In the book that he had submitted to the press right before the shark's dissection, Steno argued that anatomy had to embrace mathematics in order to improve the epistemic strengths of its claims. As he put it, there is no other source for the innumerable errors of anatomy than its disdain of the laws of mathematics until now. Although rarely mentioned outside of the history of anatomy, this book is perhaps the first serious attempt to join mathematics with anatomy in the early modern period. Therefore, it is a prime example of how these two disciplines intersected at this time. The main argument of this book was that muscle flesh should be understood as an oblique parallelepiped with bases as rectangles and lateral surfaces as parallelograms. But why did this parallelepiped model matter? Since at least the time of Galen, anatomists used to explain muscle contraction 
through the inflation of animal spirits. Now, I am not uh, particularly strong myself, but if you look to me, you notice that if you contract your bicep, the muscle looks inflated or larger. Pre-modern scholars explain this by saying that something enters the muscle to increase its size, namely the so-called animal spirits. A new version of this influx theory had just, uh, influx theory of spirits had just been proposed by René Descartes, whose treatise of men was published posthumously in Leiden when Steno lived there. Steno's model of the parallelipipe was important because it threatened to shatter the role of animal spirits in muscle contraction. His argument is easier to understand in two dimensions. Imagine that you have two parallelograms, which are cross sections of two parallelipipes. The parallelograms have different inclination angles. The one on the left corresponds to a relaxed muscle and the one on the right to a contracted muscle. Steno explains that the thickness of the parallelogram increases from one to the other because line CS is longer than line CR. But since these parallelograms have the same base and height, their areas remain the same. Remember that the area of a parallelogram is base times height. In short, if this model could really be applied to muscle fibers, a muscle could change shape while keeping its volume. No spirits were needed. Geometry alone explained the inflation. And Steno did not add anything else. He was happy just to show that, quote, the idea of animal spirits is built on an uncertain foundation. But how does this abstract model relate to Steno's emphasis on observations? Steno acknowledged that he did not exactly see a parallelipipe in muscles, but he did claim to observe something like parallel, par parallelograms in his cross sections of muscles. Steno explicitly associated his mathematical insights with an innovative cross-sectional cut of muscles along the lengths of their fibers. It took him a while to decide on how to write and illustrate his geometrical ideas since he first cut muscles by the slices in Leiden. The solution only came to him a few years later in Florence in collaboration with the mathematician Vincenzo Viviani, Galileo's last disciple. In Florence, Steno was confident enough to claim that, quote, the structure of muscles requires almost by necessity that they must be explained mathematically. He then relied on the format of Euclid's elements with a sequence of definitions, lemmas, and corollaries, all illustrated with diagrams. The maturation process of Steno's work on the muscles turned his new observations of muscles into a geometrical model. This process, alongside his use of mechanical and chemical analogies, I argue, clarifies Steno's subsequent research on fossils, and more generally, the work produced around the Academia del Cimento. Taking these into consideration, I will now return one last time to the story of how Steno developed his history of the Earth. When Steno started writing on fossils, he did not start from a blank slate. As a learned anatomist, he mastered typical works of natural history, such as those by Conrad Gesner, which he quoted in his anatomical work. Therefore, Steno knew that various other scholars also argued that fossils had an origin in sea animals. As Ivana Dal Prete has recently shown, the organic origin of fossils was the common argument among ancient and medieval writers. Scholars as varied as Aristotle, Isidore of Seville, Avicenna, and Albert the Great all agreed that sea fossils showed that dry land was once underwater. Steno himself acknowledged that, quote, the true explanation of sea fossils had become very uncertain in most recent times, since, quote, many and great are the men who did not agree with his opinion. Authors whom Steno respected favored an origin completely detached from animals, such as Ulisse Aldrovande, Athanasius Kircher, and Michele Mercati himself. In their views, fossils were the result of incomplete processes of spontaneous generation, literally jokes of nature that displayed hidden links between the macro and microcosm. But from the perspective of a 17th century anatomist, 
How could great scholars differ so much in their views if fossils and animal parts were so obviously similar? Steno had shaped his career around the crisis of certainty in anatomy. Now, the time had come to apply to the earth the same methods that he had applied to the body. Similar to his thoughts on muscles, Steno's ideas on the history of the earth took a while to develop. He concluded his first text on fossils with six conjectures that offer, quote, a glimpse of truth from the observations presented. These conjectures were simple, but presented significant blows to the idea that fossils were spontaneously generated in dry land. For instance, the first conjecture is that the soil where fossils are found does not seem to produce fossils today. Whereas the third is that such fossils were once covered with water. Steno called these claims conjectures because he did not want to necessarily argue that, quote, defenders of contrary views are wrong. He also said that his opinion was, quote, only similar to truth. Historians such as Paul of Finland have attributed this attitude to Steno's desire to please respectable authors with contrary opinions, such as the Jesuit Athanasius Kircher. And this is in part correct. Others have said that Steno was being careful to avoid the censorship of the Catholic Church. In fact, scientific publications sponsored by the Medici at this time were notoriously famous for avoiding any interpretations of experimental results. And the few historians have associated this with acts of self-censorship. The problem with this argument is that making claims about rocks or the history of the earth did not usually raise censorship problems in the 17th century. Instead, I argue that Steno's careful approach derives from his interest in distinguishing certain from uncertain knowledge, an approach that he carried forth from his research in anatomy. Steno himself said so, quote, knowledge of these things is not yet there for me to the point that I would interpose here my judgment. Besides, since he had more travels ahead, he preferred not to claim that, quote, that, that which I will observe in, in the rest of the journey is similar to what I have observed until now. But as time passed, every new observation seemed to confirm Steno's theory. Right before his first text on fossils came out of the press, a prominent collector from Milan visited Florence. After talking with him, Steno realized that, quote, there were many things among the rare pieces of his collection which quite clearly favored my conjectures. Similarly, in a visit to the city of Lucca, a physician showed Steno, quote, vertebrae found on the island of Malta, most similar to the vertebrae of fish, one of which was found clung to a lump of earth. Steno was still in time to add both notes to his text, but this last remark could only fit in the book's index. In the following months, Steno dedicated increasingly more time to fossils and the earth. One year later, he was not hesitant anymore. He no longer feared, quote, the objections of friends, reading other books, or even the inspection of new sites. Therefore, he wrote another book, the De Solido Intrasolidum Naturaliter Contento, which became his most important geological publication. Again, Steno regretted in this book that, quote, things which cannot be determined with certainty are not kept separate from those that can be so determined. But this time, there were no more conjectures. Instead, he argued with, quote, principles of nature that are in common use, widely accepted, and considered admissible by all from every school of thought. Steno was looking for an explanation that forced a sense across his diverse readers. Similar to the main publication of the Academia del Cimento, Steno also detached his theory on the formation of fossils from philosophical worldviews. Yet nowhere in his book does he suggest that he did this in order to please his patrons or to avoid religious censorship. Instead, I suggest that he did so in order to reinforce the reliability of his claims. His arguments about the formation of rocks worked regardless of the worldview that one followed, be it corpuscular, chemical, or Aristotelian. Steno stated this explicitly, quote, those things that I asserted on matter have a place, regardless of whether matter has atoms, particles changing in a thousand ways, four elements, or chemical principles. <clears throat>
In short, Steno's philosophy-ridden approach allowed him to promote knowledge that was certain. The other method that he used was to apply the same analogies to the earth that he had applied to the body. Steno's history of the earth hinged on the claim that the soil containing fossils was mixed with water a long time ago. He explained that it was perfectly reasonable to believe this because, among other things, he had seen his Danish friend and chemist, Ole Borg, quote, reducing a very hard stone into water inside insipid water. But if solids and water become one big mixture, how do they separate back again to form the earth that we see today? To answer this, Steno spoke of various natural events in which fluids produce solids. For instance, he mentioned the chemical reaction in which, quote, things dissolved in acids are precipitated by the arrival of salts or the appearance of stones inside the bladder. In the end, Steno concluded that, quote, given a solid and its location, it will be easy to say something certain about its place of production, even if, even if that place is completely different from its current location. And this is still one of the main claims of modern geology. But the strongest links between Steno's history of the earth and of the body are in his approaches to the muscles, the topic that occupied him when he shifted his research to fossils. The first link has to do with format. In his mathematical treatise on muscles, Steno used a format similar to that of Euclid's elements. He started with a list of definitions and then followed them with lemmas and corollaries that constantly referred back to these definitions. In a striking parallel, he started his first text on fossils with a list of itemized observations to which he had recourse to in the following conjectures. He even printed in the book's margins the relevant observations that he used in each conjecture. That is, just as he used the systematic model to understand muscle contraction, so too he developed a systematic model to explain fossilization. More interestingly, Steno's visual arguments of the Earth's strata owe much to his muscle diagrams. In De Solido, Steno explained the origin of mountains by saying that, quote, strata are themselves solids naturally contained within solids. Like fossils, he wrote, quote, whenever a certain stratum was formed, it was either surrounded by another solid body on the sides, or it covered the entire globe of the Earth. This is an early formulation of what is now known as Steno's principle of lateral continuity. Steno then applied his ideas to the formation of the Tuscan landscape. Strikingly, he relied on cross-sectional slices of these landscapes, which he represented with geometrical diagrams. Steno was not the first to use diagrams in this context. René Descartes, for example, also drew cross-sections of the earth in his Principles of Philosophy, which Steno knew well. But Steno's diagrams are similar to Descartes, only in external appearances. First, Steno's diagrams represent an opposing view to the Cartesian theory of the origin of mountains. Descartes spoke of mountains growing through the earth. You can see here the destruction of the crust leading to a new mountain rising. But Steno spoke of waters drying down and strata breaking into valleys. His diagrams should be read bottom up from 25 to 20 where 25 is the original earth, and the last, number 20, is the earth as we know it today. More importantly, Steno's traded diagrams have a direct antecedent in his diagrams of muscle contraction. Just as his first diagrams were a result of observing cross-sections of muscles, so too his new diagrams represent a cross-sectional view of the earth's strata. Indeed, cross-sectional diagrams became so useful to Steno that even though he did not publish more geology books, he used them again to depict a cave that he explored in the Alps two years later. In short, Steno's diagrams alongside his comparative and cross-disciplinary methods confirmed to him the epistemic strength of his approach. Quote, how well then everything fits, how well these things conspire between themselves in unanimous agreement. In conclusion, while crossing the roads of Europe from north to south, Nicolaus Steno, just like all of us who go out on hikes, 
probably marveled at the spectacular landscapes around him and wondered how they were formed. Through his research on fossils, Steno found a solution that in turn opened new fields of research that encompass more than just modern geology. For instance, Charles Lyell's book, Principles of Geology, one of the main influences behind Darwin's theory of evolution, states that Steno's geology was, quote, the most remarkable work of that period. But I suspect that neither Lyell nor Darwin knew that it all started with Steno's anatomy. In this talk, I showed that rather than a geological genius or a Renaissance polymath, Nicolaus Steno was an anatomist seriously concerned with method. The disciplines of anatomy, earth history, physical mathematics, and chemistry intersected at his hands as part of his response to the crisis of certainty. Moreover, Steno's claims about the earth were not entirely new. What was original and convincing were his empirical and analogical arguments, which he developed out of his anatomical training and research at the University of Leiden. Therefore, his writings in geology are as much a product of his Northern European career as they are of the context of the Academia del Cimento. In this light, Steno's work challenges geographical generalizations that sometimes appear in histories of early modern European science. My point is not that the Italian context did not play a role in Steno's work. Rather, this new context was important because it reinforced much of what Steno was already doing before arriving in Italy, such as his explorations of mathematics and chemistry and anatomy. In a nutshell, Steno expanded his research interests as a response to problems that he encountered in his specific historical context. But it is precisely because of this context that they were so significant to him, to his peers, and to historians of science today. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you.